Hi, this is Bob Wells here, and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. This is the show where we hear about people's interests and uncover some fascinating stories at the same time. I hope you enjoy today's show. Hello, and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. In today's show, I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Cannon. Paul has been on a quest to find a more non-materialistic lifestyle, and today he talks about his journey and his many interests and projects, which include, amongst other things, his own brewery, Tudor reenacting, the refitting of a 1976 Mercedes horse box, and a project to rewild one acre of farmland. Hello and welcome to the show, Paul. Hello, Bob. Thank you for having me on. Oh, it's it's great to great to talk to you. I've seen you um, on one of these brewery Facebook groups, which is how I obviously got got to know you. Yes, yeah. I mean, a, a few of those um, find them very useful for um, learning and sharing tips and things. Yeah. Yeah, well, we can probably talk a bit about beer a bit later on. One, one of my favourite hobbies, I have to say. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, how was last year? Obviously, with COVID, we've we've all had a lot of um, pressures on us. How's it been for you? Yeah, it was a funny year. Um, I was in my final year at university, um, working towards my final assignments, my dissertation, and then we had the lockdown. So yeah. that made things difficult. Um, we had no more classes try to do things online a little bit and finish it off at home but that was it went it went reasonably well I, I, I did okay with that yeah and then I'd always planned I'd always envisaged that when I finished uni I'd go off for a long epic journey in my van somewhere and of course that didn't happen um I managed to get away a couple of times but yeah most of it was spent at home working on my various projects yeah um uh, but so it's kept me busy that's great. Well, obviously, you've got a, a one hell of a lot of projects on, I have to say. And and but before we talk about your various interests, could you just tell us, please, a bit about you and your journey and your previous career and how you found yourself wanting to live a more non-materialistic lifestyle, please? Yeah. Um, well, I'm I'm 61 now. Um, married with three grown-up girls. Um, I spent my last. 30 years I spent 30 years working for the MOD yeah as a civilian um it was in transportation logistics data analysis kind of thing and um uh I loved the job but things change and um I felt that it was the time was right for a change a big change yeah so I took early retirement in 2017 to go to university and I thought I'd just see where things lead from there. And what did you study at university, Paul? It was sociology and psychology. Oh, wow. So that was quite interesting in making you look at things about life that you've always taken for granted and start questioning, why are things this way? Do they have to be this way? Can they be a different way? And look at alternative lifestyles. And that kind of opens up your idea then. Um, you know, there are alternative ways of living and different options and you start to question things a bit so that was quite a, a good course to do really yeah i bet it was and, and was that local whereabouts whereabouts do you live then um i live just outside of ferry st edmunds okay and, yeah, in suffolk. and that was it uh, yes in suffolk and it was in in the town it's part of the university of suffolk yeah so it was it was very handy for me to go in yeah um quite convenient quite local for me and this this sort of build up to um, taking early retirement and and looking for an alternative lifestyle and then and then going to university, um, was it something that that happened over a long period of time or was it, or was it did something start it? You know how how, how much were your family involved? Do you tell us a bit about um, that, please? Yeah, when I started sitting down and thinking about it, I thought well, actually it has been quite a long time since it first started. I hadn't really perhaps realised at the time, but thinking back when. I think it started uh, when my first daughter was born. Yeah. Um, she's born in uh, 1990. And she went to school. She went to school for a year. And for various reasons, and um, we decided to take her out and homeschool her. And, uh, and then three and a half years later, my second daughter was born. Yeah. And it made sense that she didn't go to school either. And then a few years later, my third daughter was born. And she didn't go to school. And by homeschooling, we started to meet up with other people who were slightly alternative and look at other lifestyles. And I think it started from there. 
when I think back about it. And then I had other projects. I remember back in 2007, um, I decided to build a, a biodiesel processor. Oh, yeah. So um, I've got a copper hot water tank, a couple of steel drums, with the chemicals, pumps, pipe and things. Went around collecting waste oil and produced biodiesel and ran my car on it. And uh, ran it for about two years. Oh, wow. Um, and... You know, it ran fine, but it always smelled of chip fat. I was going to say, did did everybody know that they, they, they knew who it was when they when you were driving up to their house? They they did, yeah. Ten minutes before, yes. <laughs> yes or when I used to drive to work, the yeah. um, because of the MOD, you had the guards on the gate. They always used to say, "Oh, I fancy chips now." Well, now you've driven past, it always, always smell like a chip shop. But I think the journey kind of began then. Yeah. On, on the homeschooling front, obviously at the moment with lockdown, um, yes, people having a lot of experience with homeschooling. Um, is it something that you would recommend, or does it depend on the way that people look at things? Well, what are your thoughts on um, that? I'd, really, I think what the parents are trying to do at the moment, because they're having to have their children at home, um, arguably it's not really homeschooling. Um, it's trying to carry on schooling at home. Yeah. Um, when you look at homeschooling, it, it takes, I mean, there are various approaches, but it takes quite a different approach. It's not so structured. There's usually not so much an emphasis or worry about exams. Um, it's more of a, a lifestyle thing, and you, you choose it. The, the parents who are having to do it, they've got, you know, I don't, they've got my deeper sympathies because it is hard for them. Yes. Um, the schools, I think, are giving work to the children because they think that's what they've got to do the parents are trying to get the children to do it when they think that's what they've got to do when really my advice would be really don't worry about it so much don't put the children under any pressure have this time for them to relax and enjoy themselves as much as they can yeah and and not put them under that pressure because they will catch up yeah and, and now that your children are older, um, when they look back at their um, sort of homeschooling, what 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 are their reactions to it? Um, with great fondness, they've formed um, wonderful relationships. You know, with, uh, made lots of good friends. Yeah. Because some people think it's uh, it's isolating, but it's not. It's actually there's a big community of homeschoolers. Um, what? So the, the children people. actually meet up with with the other the other people all the time. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, there's lots of socialising. There's lots of um, getting people in to do workshops, whether it's a parent who happens to be a potter, for example, will do a pottery workshop, or sometimes they'll pay for people to come in to do yeah. workshops. But they learn so many different skills, and um, it gives them, it, it encourages their, their love of learning. Yeah. I'm not saying that school doesn't always, but no. um, it is a different approach. Yeah. So As the... So the, the homeschooling was the, the when you, when your um, daughter was born in 1990, I think it was. Um, yes. The homeschooling thing was the first part that you can sort of look back to and say, well, actually, this is I, I'm starting to get interested in li you know living a, a slightly alternative lifestyle. Would you say? I, I think it is. Yeah. I think I mean, think when I look back, I've always been interested in minimalism, self self sufficiency, alternative living as a concept, but. I was like everybody else. I was, I had my full-time job. I had a second job. Sometimes I even had a third job. Um, my wife was working as well to, you know, pay the bills and pay the mortgage. And it was a, a pretty conventional life, really. Um, but looking back, I think that's when it started. It started and then, the and then you um, started developing all these other interests that you've mentioned, like um, Tudor reenacting and Morris dancing and brewing. Yes. And, and, and tree hugging. Yes. Do people um, actually hug trees? Not literally. No. No. Um, but I think being out in in the nature, getting away from other people, finding that quiet spot, whether it's in the forests or up mountains or at the coast, um, I think it's so therapeutic for everybody. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've been watching Winter Watch at the moment. Uh, not um, this particular series, but I have I've watched it in the past and Spring Watch. It's yes, uh, very therapeutic. It is, and that's always been a popular program because so many people appreciate how 
important it is to your well-being to be out in nature. Yes. And I've actually read where uh, I think plants give off some sort of chemical which our body absorbs and actually um, it's a bit like serotonin. It makes you feel well. It makes you happy. And um, I think too many people don't have enough time out in nature now. No. Um, just away from the crowds to be able to calm your mind down. Yeah, uh, I, I think... must admit, I, I often go for, uh, particularly at weekends, a, a nice long walk in the country. Um, yes. And it doesn't matter how you feel at the beginning. When you, when you come back, you, you do feel invigorated. That's right. And um, I think, you know, if you've got a dog especially and you take the dog in all weathers all year round um, out into the countryside, that's one of the best things you can do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think... I think some countries actually start to pres- prescribe, uh, doctors prescribe a walk in the countryside as a treatment. Is that right? And yes, I've, I've, I've read about it. Um, I can't remember where it is, but I can yeah. understand that because it is such a good thing for you. Yeah. The fresh air, the exercise, the calming yeah. of the mind. Yeah. Um, so I would encourage everybody to do as much as they can. And I would guess that that's something that um, your, you and your family uh, did when the children were young and have, have carried on. Yes, we always did. Um, we used to like going. Um, Derbyshire was one of our favourite places places to go. Um, when the children were very young, I'd have them um, on my shoulders. We'd go out walking the hills. Yeah. And um, in the you know, Suffolk wildlife places, wildlife trust places, we've always taken them out and, and done that. So when, and, yeah, so so you've got the home the homeschooling started, you're getting out in nature a bit more. When, when did some of the, what was the first of these sort of hobbies that you mentioned earlier on uh, that you got into, these interests like Tudor in acting, et cetera? I think the next big change was probably, I think it was 2010. Yeah. Um, as I said, I've been working all hours, doing a second job, sometimes doing a third job. And we were living somewhere, it wasn't, we didn't really like it. And just outside of Bury St Edmunds, there's a big, uh, I guess you'd call it a country estate. There's a farmer or there's a family who own oh, countless acres of fields around here. And they've got about uh, 100, and, 100 plus cottages, old houses uh, dotted around. Um, they were built in the early 1800s. They've never been modernised. No. Very, very basic, you know, old places. Yeah. I had a friend who lived in one of them and she told me about one which is coming up for rent and we came and take a look, took a look at it and um, fell in love with it. It was everything we'd ever dreamed of that we could never have afforded. Yeah. Um, it was very basic. The rent was substantially cheaper than the mortgage we were paying and we thought, why don't we sell the house, um, move into this rented place and just for the quality of life. Yeah. And that's what we did. Uh, I mean, it was very basic. Um, it had never had mains electricity, for example. Um, so it was entirely off grid. Um, so we had an old generator and three car batteries, and that was our power. Wow. We'd run the generator maybe for an hour when we had the washing machine on to power the washing machine. And while that was going on, we charge up the car batteries, our laptops, our mobile phones, and then um, we had all, our wired all for 12 volt lighting, and we used to just live like that. And you're still uh, still in that house now, are you? Yes, although we did get electricity three years ago. Oh wow! <laughs> um, so it was uh, it was quite a change when that came. Just for listeners, Suffolk in England, uh, not every house doesn't have electricity. I think there's just a few <laughs> left. <laughs> so and, so um, two, so 2010, um, bit of a change there. Definitely, you know, going going to a place that was off grid. Um, yes, and at the same time, um, that's when I started doing the Tudor reenacting. Yeah. Um, which is a place called Kentwell Hall in uh, near Sudbury in Suffolk. Can you just describe to listeners what what Tudor reenacting is, please? Yes, I mean, for a lot of people, reenacting they think about um, dressing up as military and fighting each other, but this is quite different. Um, Kentwell Hall is owned by um, a, a couple who have bought it since the seventies when it was a, a wreck, basically. And what we're doing is recreating everyday life. 
So, um, for example, um, I'm a brewer there, and the it's part of the moat house that was built in 1503. It's always there's always been a brewery. So when I'm there, I spend my days brewing, as a brewer would have done in the early 1500s. Oh right. Um, it's and it's almost self-supporting. We've got the bakehouse there that bakes the bread, um, as the Tudors would have done for us to eat during our for our pottage, our lunch. Yeah. The dairy makes the butter. You've got the gardeners. There are all kinds of tradespeople there. Basket makers, uh, weavers. Um, there are a few militia as well. You've got the woodmen who have to provide the wood for the house to work, and yep. it is everyday living. And the visitors all come in and spend the day there, just going round and looking at all the different trades and skills that we have there. And when you're actually um, doing this reenacting as a, as a brewer and and seeing yes. your um, you know friends and colleagues who are doing different stuff. How does it actually feel? Does it actually take you back to what you think times would have been like? It does. Um, We're very, we insist on authenticity. So the costumes are are very authentic. They're hand stitched, for example. They're not machine stitched because you cannot have machine stitching showing. No. Um, The speech we use is as authentic as we can get. Yeah. Um, I wear glasses, but I wear glasses of a style that were, around in the 1500s oh, right. um, especially made yeah with, with leather, leather strap to strap it on my head yes um and it does really feel like you're fully immersed yeah does, does your, often, the rest of your family get involved with this as well yes yes they do um my not my wife she stays at home but my three daughters do it oh lovely um in fact they started before me yeah and not only have they enjoyed it they've learned skills as well so Things like um, making bread, making butter. My middle daughter worked in the stables for a few years as an ostler, handling the horses. Yeah. Um, they're all quite good with a bow and arrow. They've learnt their archery skills. Um, they've they learned so many different skills there. Um, it's, it's all it's all very educational. So the the, the Tudor reenacting acting is is it like I say I I misconstrued it i just thought it was a lot of chaps getting together and um, fighting each other uh, or pretending no. to fight each other but but it sounds a lot different to that so so people from you know what sort of people do it different walks of life all sorts yeah. um yes there's quite a mixture there i think um i think we've got professors there we've got teachers you know people from the professions um and just you know ordinary folk as well yeah. all ages yeah so I think my granddaughter, my granddaughter started going there when she was just a, a few months old. And um, my, my daughter was just nursing her there. And my, I've got three grandchildren. They've all grown up doing it. It becomes second nature to yeah, them. Yeah, that sounds great. And then what was, what was the next interest that you got into? Um, around about that same time, um, well, that same year I bought, my horse box, which I've got. Um, I wanted something to stay in when I was doing the Tudor reenacting, but I also had this idea of being able to go traveling a bit further afield as well. So uh, the horse box, it was it was quite basic when I bought it. Um, although it had actually belonged to a, a traveler before me. Yeah. who used to go around the country making bridles and things for the heavy horses. Right. Um, so he lived in the front half, but the back half was completely as it would have been when the horses were there, but with his, um, or his leather and his equipment and things. And how old is the, the actual horse box itself? Uh, it's 1976 it was built, yeah. so it's 40, up for 45 years old now. Wow, and, and you're currently refitting that, are you? Yes, yeah, so I'd, I'd, I'd equipped it first of all to go away back in 2010, um and did a, a reasonable job but it was a bit basic and what i've been doing since finishing uni is um changing it substantially yeah. upgrading it so i'm fitting a shower a toilet um it's got solar panels on the roof for electricity an lpg boiler for hot water 
Yeah. It's got a wood burner. Wow. Um, it's got a double bed over the cab, onboard water tanks. Yeah. And it's completely self-contained. And you intend to do a lot of travelling with that, do you? I do. Um, I'm also looking at renting it out um, as a ho- sort of a holiday let through Airbnb or something like that, um, just to bring a bit of income in. But I'm making it all fully self-sufficient so that I can go off wherever I want to in it as well. And are you going to go off to other countries or are you going to stay in the UK? Um, because of the size of it and because of it, it's not very fast, I'll probably stay in the UK. Um, well, I've, I've got another van which I've converted um, yeah. over the last three years, which um, is a much newer van. Yeah. Um, and I've been able to take that away. So last year I took it to Peak District. Yeah. The year before I took it up to um, Ben Nevis. And the year before I went to the Lake District. Yeah, all well, lovely places. <laughs> oh, they are. Yeah. I, I like walking. Yeah. Um, yeah. I take my youngest daughter, and because um, she's still single, then we go off and we do a lot of the uh, hill climbing. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, um, you, you say like walking. You also like dancing. You, you mentioned that you um, you got into I Morris do, dancing. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I like the Morris dancing. Yeah. For, for listeners around the world that haven't really heard of Morris dancing, are you able to give people an idea as to what it is, please? Oh, well, it's it's arguable about how old it is as a tradition but it certainly dates back i think to shakespeare times so it's a very much an english origin is it? it it is very english there are different styles yeah um the one that most people might be familiar with is um what we call cotswold and it's where the dancers um it was traditionally all all males although that's thankfully changed now but it used to be all males they'd have the white trousers usually a, a white shirt and handkerchiefs and they'd dance with sticks or handkerchiefs. Um, it's like country music, folk music. Yeah. Uh, most dances involve six dances, but you can have different numbers to that as well. Um, the other popular style in this country is uh, border morris, which yeah. comes from the Welsh borders. This is quite different. You uh, normally have a painted face. Traditionally, it was black, but lots of different coloured nails, colours now for painted faces. Black trousers, usually what we call a tatter jacket. So it would be a jacket with lots of bits of cloth hanging off, almost like feathers, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I've seen that. Do you have any photos of yourself with with the? Um, I do. The yes. Well, yes, I'll tell you um, what we'll do then, just for listeners. We'll, we'll uh, on the social media stuff. We'll, we'll put some of the, um, if you don't mind, we'll put some pictures of you. Is that okay? Yes. Um, <laughs> there is a there is one picture of me, I think, on my Facebook page for the brewery. Oh, is that? Um, uh, Wittestest Brewery. I yeah. think if you look on there, there's a picture of me with my uh, Morris clothes on with a green face. Okay, uh, so bre- brewing, that, that's another interest of yours. And, and I understand that you've actually got a a, um, um, a brewery that is licensed to sell beer. That's right. A very small well, brewery. I'm, I'm, at the moment, I'm licensed to produce it and sell it to... Um, other premises they've got a, a, a premises license yeah um, and, and did the did the brewery what you mentioned that when you were doing all the um, reenactment um is that how the brewing started yes uh i i'd always been interested in brewing i think like a lot of people i had done the boots kits when yeah. i was younger yeah um with mixed success and explosions in airing cupboards yes all that sort of thing <laughs> yes but when i started um the the tudor reenacting there was a fellow there who'd been doing the Tudor brewing um, who had changed, I think used to be in marketing or something, yeah. but he'd developed an interest in brewing uh, because of being at Kentwell. And then he'd gone off to start his own brewery down in Kent. And um, I thought, oh, that's quite interesting. I'd like to do something similar to that. So I learnt the skills a little bit from brewing there because if you can brew something drinkable under those conditions then you can brew pretty much anywhere because it's it's very difficult there and um it grew from that and where where do you where do you where is your brewery now then is it is it still at the um uh, the place where you do the reenactment or or um do you have it near um, home i i i I still do brewing when i go there but my main brewery 
this is the garden shed it's about 10 foot by 10 foot um in my garden yeah and that's what i've got registered um as the brewery that must be one of the smallest breweries in england i think it is the the shed itself is about 10 foot by 10 foot yeah and i don't think there's any breweries smaller than that that i know of and at the moment i only produce small amounts of beer um seasonal beers yes and so i think in terms of output as well i'm quite probably the smallest one and, and the name three three sisters brewery how, how, how did you get that name ah uh, well I'll, i've got the the three daughters who oh. um i think they're like the weird sisters <laughs> but also i'm a bit of a terry pratchett fan Oh, yeah. And um, Terry Pratchett has written about the Weird Sisters in some of his books. Oh, it's the Weird Sisters Brewery, not Three Sisters Brewery. No, it's Weird Sisters, oh, okay. yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's based on that. And the Weird Sisters are also the three witches in Macbeth. So it works very well. Yes. And what sorts of what, what sorts of beers do you produce? Um, I do seasonal ones. Yeah. Um, there's a, a thing called the Wheel of the Year where there are eight festivals throughout the year that marks the solstices and the equinoxes and the cross festivals. Yeah. And what I try to do is produce a different beer that's um, seasonal and reflects the time of the year. Yeah. Um, I also do one main beer throughout the year as well, but I, I try to do different ones each time. Yeah. And do, do you, um, I mean, I think you mentioned you, you, you're producing sort of 40 pints a month. Um, yes. Do you, do you sell most of that or, or is most of that for sort of family consumption? Uh, it's about half and half, I think. Oh, yeah. um, there's, a, there's a specialist beer shop in town who will buy as much of my beer as he can. Yeah. Um, so some of it goes there. Uh, I'm also part of a home brew club, which is invaluable so to learning how to produce better beers so i take a lot of that there but i also do um things like uh tree fairs uh, festivals in the summer where i've been able to set a, a bar up and then sell to the public yeah and that pays for me to have the weekend away so it's it i, I don't want it to be too big or make too much money from it i yeah. do it as a hobby but yeah. it funds some of my other things i like to do yeah. So it's it's great the way that you've explained how you've sort of got into this um, more or wanting to get more into a, a non-materialistic lifestyle and how some of these interests are developed along the way. Um, yeah. Now, I wanted to talk about your latest project, unless there's any other interest that you want to speak about first. I'd like to talk about the rewilding area. Yes, it, it came about really as a, um, after a chance conversation I had the um so where i am in this cottage um we're in the middle of nowhere really the nearest house other than our immediate neighbor is a mile away so we're just surrounded by farmland yeah and um i thought it'd be nice i always thought it'd be nice to take a bit of the field alongside the house and extend it out a little bit just a, a few meters just to put a some plant some trees and put a pond in and there's a fellow who works for the landlord on the whole of the estate who goes around planting trees and felling them and doing everything else. And I was chatting to him one day. I said, I'd like to go out and do this bit of field. Just you know, as a conversation, really. And then I saw him again a couple of weeks later. And he says, oh, I spoke to Ben, the landlord, about what you want to do. And he's really up for it. Why don't you give him a call and see what he says? Yeah. So I thought, oh, OK. So I phoned him. I said, oh, hi, you know, I, I know that. Jamie had spoken to you about, I'd like to take a bit of that field up. And he says, yes, would you like to go right up to the main road, which is about 400 metres away, and square the whole bit off? Wow. I said, well, I said, I don't think I can afford that. How much would it be? And he said, well, it's about an acre. He said, it's, it's about £40 pounds a month for that. <laughs> I thought, oh, well, I can afford 40 quid a month. Yeah. Um, and he said, now's the ideal time because... They'd all been harvested, the field, and there was nothing growing in there. There, there were no crops. No. So now's the ideal time to do it. I said, all right then, with no idea what I was going to do about it. Yeah. So um, I said, yeah, all right. So we agreed, and then I went and put some posts in the ground to mark it off. Um, then there was a chap who was digging a 
trench across the field to relay some water pipes. So I had a word of him and said, when you finish, could you just come to this corner of the field over here, please, and dig a bit of a pond out for me, uh, which he did. And I thought, OK, I've got the start of this now. I really need to work out what I'm going to do with it. And um, so you hadn't really had any any sort of um, coaching or training in, into how to do something like this major project. No, no. You're learning as you're going along. No, I've been buying a few books since this was back in August. So I've been buying some books about how to plan woodland, yeah. um, what to plant, the arguments for and against putting things in or just leaving it to go wild naturally and um, taking advice from different people yeah. um, just to work out what the best thing is to do. So what's, what's the long-term aim of it? Where, where will it be in five years' time, this piece of land? I think in five years' time, well, the pond is already full, and that's already greening up. You can see where the whole of the area, the wild grasses are coming back in and things are starting to grow. Um, I've planted a number of saplings up the far end, yeah. um, different, different types of tree. So in five years' time, oh, I've got a lot more planted by then, hopefully. Um, I've planted a hedge down the fourth side to square it all off. So the hedge will have grown. The trees will have started to grow, have become a bit more established. They'll have greened up, hopefully. Um, I think the more I learn, the more I realise it's best just to let things do it, you know, go by itself as much as possible. Yeah. So once I've got a few more trees in, I think I'll just leave it because nature knows best. Yeah. And and just let it go quite wild. So you should be getting in theory you should be getting some um new in uh, new insects and wildlife in there. Yes. Yeah, I've already seen some little um I think a water boatman in the water. Yeah. There's some other insects there. Um we're a bit of an oasis here for wild for birds. Yeah. Um at the moment we've got some red kites have been flying around here. We've got buzzards. Um, we've got peregrine falcons around here. Um, so I think it's going to attract a lot of the wildlife. And is it is it um, is one of your aims to actually invite people to come and have a look at it? Yes, it is. Um, I'm doing it largely for the local um, homeschool group. Yeah. So um, the aim is the children can come along. Uh, which they already do, play in there, help me plant little saplings, um, and then learn a little bit about nature as well. My youngest daughter, I should mention this perhaps, my youngest daughter, um, she's a volunteer for Suffolk Wildlife Trust. Yes. She's at uni at the moment um, doing a, uh, I think they call it a foundation degree, the qualifications to go on to do the actual degree. Yeah. She's doing that in wildlife. Um, she's aiming to go to Wales uh, in September to do a wildlife conservation degree there. So it's a good ground for her to start learning the basics and then hopefully come back and apply what she learns when she's at uni. Yeah, I bet it is. What about your friends and um, colleagues and that? Have, have any of them come around and, and sort of thought, well, actually, I wouldn't mind doing something like this? I have, yes. And a lot of them have um, donated things as well. I've had a, a friend donated, I think, um, four walnut trees a few days ago. Lovely. And somebody else brought around a rowan bush. So these people have, have, have got quite um, quite into it and um, you know, helping me by sourcing different trees for me from different places, Yeah, which has been quite encouraging. So what advice would you give someone who was, who was thinking of undertaking a similar project in the future? I'd say that, not everybody can have the opportunity to do it to the scale that I'm doing it to, but I think everybody does have the option to do something they can help yeah. towards nature. If it's just you've got a bit of garden where you can make a tiny little pond, um, I think somebody um, has made one out of an old sink or something like that. Yeah. Um, but it can be a tiny little pond. Yeah. Um, if you've got a lawn, let some of your grass just grow long around the edges and um let it go a little bit wild or just one little section and anything anything like that at all uh, all adds up yeah 
So you, you got this this piece of land in August, and you and you've worked it obviously over the autumn and, and the first part of the winter. Um, yes. What have you have you learned anything in that process? Um, the one big thing I've learned is be observant and um, see what it does. Because when I first had the the pond dug, I was thinking, okay, this is a big pond now. How on earth am I going to get it full? Um, when it rains, the water runs down the little lane out the front of the house, but the other side of the other side of the lane. So I was trying to work out how I could dig a ditch to divert all this water into the field, and how I could capture it all, or run guttering from the house across to the pond to fill it up. And I started digging trenches, and then we had a few days of rain, and it was filled up by itself. And I thought if I just been a bit more patient, and just watched and observed. Um, for a few months, I would have seen that, you know, how things go naturally and work with it rather than trying to work against it. So would you say that um, it's taught you to slow down a bit? Yes, I think that is it. I think it's just slow down, observe, see what happens naturally, and then after a year, perhaps, yeah, do you know, do something if you if you, if it's necessary. But yeah, it's it's nice to slow down, and it's. What I do most mornings, once I first get up and I've got dressed, I go out. I just like to go and sit in the, stand in the field for a few minutes and just notice those little changes which are happening. And they're so gradual, you can hardly notice them. But after a while, you do see how things are changing. And I guess, and, um, where are we now? We're in, we're in January, getting towards the end of January. Um, yes. The nights are just starting to draw out a bit. Mornings are coming in, etc. So I guess yeah. in the next few weeks, early you know, m- month or two, there's going to be a lot of changes happening. I think so, yes. You can see the, the hint of what's going to come. Yeah. But I think um, certainly as we go towards the spring, it's going to green up a lot more. There are buds on a lot of the trees at the moment. They'll start to you kind know, of start to leaf soon. Yeah. Um, I think over the next three, yeah, the next three months or so, we'll see a, a lot of changes happening there. I'm interested in discussing the um, the original intention of of or, or the way that your life has developed in 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 desiring a more non materialistic lifestyle. And it's, it's certainly with all this all this all these hobbies and interests you've got, and leading up to this latest one, I can see that happening. Um, do you think it's it is fairly straightforward for people to live a, a more non-materialistic lifestyle in, in the 21st century? I think it can be. I mean, as I was saying earlier, I was caught up in the same lifestyle as everybody else yeah. for a long while. And you tend not to look outside the box. You, you go to work, work hard, come home, have your tea, watch the television, go to bed, relax at the weekends if you can, and then the thing repeats. Yeah. But I think when you sit down and look at it and you start to question things you, and look around, you start to realise that it doesn't have to be that way, that you, know, you can make small changes in your life. So even for those those sort of um, younger people with small, fa- you know, young families and everything, there's still stuff they can do, is there, in, in, in their life that can be more than materialistic? I think so. Um, one of the first things I would say is um, get rid of the television. Right. Um, no more Netflix. <laughs> no, although I do like to sit and watch a film once in a while. Yeah. Um, like everybody does, but yeah. um, it's a bit of a treat rather than sitting in front of the television every evening. Yeah. Um, I would say that. Um, another thing, some advice I came across at one time, this was um, somebody had written a book there on the radio. They said, if you sit down and if you look at how much you actually earn in a year, but you deduct from that all your costs, for example, how much it costs you to get to work and back, whether it's a bus or a train or you're having to run a car, and you take into account the depreciation on your car, the wear and tear, and what it actually costs you to earn that money. And then, so you've got your net income after all of that. Then you look at how many hours you're working and include your commuting time as well. Yeah. What your true hourly rate is, you'd be surprised at how low it is. Then when you want to go and buy something like a smart TV or a new mobile phone or something, work out, well, actually, how many hours did I have to really work to be able to afford this? And um, it's quite surprising how much effort you've had to put into it. Yeah. 
then you think, well, did I really want to do all those hours just for this? Could I not buy it, not do so many hours, and spend more time out in nature or something like that? Or yeah, and um, you know, a, bit of, a bit of a reevaluation, I think. Yeah. So, so um, since you've retired and and you did your degree and you got into all this stuff, uh, would you say that you're a happier person? Oh, a lot happier. Yeah. Um, I hadn't realised how stressful my job was. Um, I loved my job. Um, yeah. I, I loved the people I worked with. But when I look back now, um, about the hours I was doing, and I was working from home as well, um, I, you know, so much happier. So do you feel that you, you've got a more fulfilled life? Absolutely, yes. Yes. Um, it's a bit difficult at the moment with the, covid not yeah. being able to go out and socialize but yeah. um yes yeah, so i think we're all much happier yeah i spend more time with my children more time with my grandchildren um i've been have more time to go out and go walking and um hopefully next year or later this year perhaps go over, able to get a bit further afield but yes it's, it's um much better I think I've lost weight. I'm not sitting at a desk all the time, so I've certainly lost weight. I feel much um, fitter. Are there any other um, projects that you would like to share with listeners before we wrap up? I've got my middle daughter has got a van as well, which I'm helping her convert. All right. Um, and my youngest daughter has got a van. I'm helping her to convert. Yeah. My oldest daughter wants to get another van. We need help at some point. Um, but no, the next big next big project, um, well, it's not really a project, is with my van. I want to take the van up to um, drive across to Sweden or Norway up to the Arctic Circle. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And go and see the Northern Lights. Fantastic. So that's the next thing I'm working towards. That's all these things here are have finished off and yeah. I've actually got time for myself. Um, yes, it's going to be uh, northern Sweden or northern Norway uh, up there. See the northern lights. Yeah, no, that um, sounds really exciting. Well, um, I think there's been a fantastic conversation, Paul. Um, I think you've given a lot of people... to me. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I, th- I, think, I think a lot of the things you do, most people don't do, um, but might want to consider some of these more natural things and... and uh, which I think probably would lead to a more fulfilling life. Um, I hope but, so. Even if anybody makes small changes in their life, yeah. um, it, 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 it all helps. Yeah, no, you're an inspiration. Thanks ever so much, Paul, and um, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for having me. You have been listening to Undercurrent Stories. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family. And if you have 60 seconds, I will be most grateful if you would please rate and review. To hear more episodes, please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com. If you leave your email in the link, we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released. Also, check out our social media links, details of which can be found on the show notes. Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best. 